lot. The book of Romans, the first chapter, verses 16 and 17. This is going to be an awesome passage this morning. It's one of the ones that we go to in Romans. And uh, we're always looking forward to it. It's going to be, for the most part, a very inspiring, uplifting, and motivational type of a message. Because the words there talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It talks about how we're not to be ashamed of it. I mean, it's, and it's going to, we're going to lay out the plan of salvation. Uh, and we're going to lay it all out. And uh, we're going to understand the power that the... And, and then so we're going to leave here today. We're going to be uplifted because of the word of God. That changes next week. Next week, we take on a whole different <coughs> tone. As a matter of fact, <coughs> probably middle of third chapter, we're going to be talking about sin. And so what we'll do is, as we're trudging through this, these passages over the next month or so on sin, we're going to come back to this passage today, and we're going to remember how the gospel overcomes all those things he's talking about with sin. And we'll see the power. So this message today, I want you to etch it into your brains, into your minds, into your soul, because over the next few weeks after this, you're going to feel like you're a dirty, rotten sinner. And you know why? Because you are one. And we're going to know that that can be overcome, and hopefully has been overcome in your life, by the God power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So just keep this in mind. So let's look at Romans. Have I got the right one up this morning? I do. <laughs> awesome. And you'll have to pardon me. Every once in a while, I may have to turn my head and uh, take care of necessary business up here just so that I can keep going on. <coughs> Faith in the good news. Let's look at the first verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who is believing both Jew, first, and Greek. This is his thesis statement. Y'all know what a thesis, a thesis statement is? It's basically a one statement that summarizes the entire book. <coughs> and he says it right up here in the front. I am not ashamed of the, God, of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who is believing. That's the message that this whole book is going to convey and wants everyone to know. And so as we go through this book, we'll be referring back to this many, many times in some way or the other. And no matter how dark it gets in the first few chapters, this is the ray of hope, the light that, he has, that, that Paul has written for us and that God has given him and hopefully given us. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to save. This reveals... Paul's heart. In a sophisticated city like Rome, and it was, it was the Paris or the New York of the time. It was the city. Some might be embarrassed by a gospel that centered on a crucified Jewish Savior and embraced by the lowest of classes. Paul is not ashamed. I want you to kind of, we, we kind of take it in a different frame of mind, but let's put it in the way Paul was. What was he saying the last week? He was telling everybody, no, I'm coming. I'm going to visit. I want to come and preach for you. I want, because he'd never been there. And there were people telling the church in Rome, there were people telling him, he'll never come here because we're too sophisticated. We're too rich. His gospel won't make a dent here in this city 
because we're too smart. Okay? Paul says, and you know, here, here we've got the fact that the gospel had been given by God himself made Paul unashamed of the gospel. No man should ever be ashamed of anything concerning the God of the universe. Rome was a moral sewer. For all that, that all this stuff they talk about how great it was, it was a moral sewer. Paul was a subhuman in their eyes. He was a hated Jew. His message was unbelievable. Now think about this. He's going into this group of people, sophisticates, and he's going to tell them the news that there was a guy that was born by the bird virgin. They're going to go, what? He lived the perfect and sinless life. He did nothing wrong. Yeah, right. He went and died on a cross. Well, probably for lying like that he should have, right? That's what they're, they're thinking. <laughs> And then three days later, he rose again. Oh, now you've lost me. This is silliness. That's foolishness. <clears throat> then he says, oh, and by the way, he was sitting up in heaven. He's coming back again. Okay, let me call the doctor. Because you obviously need some medical. I wouldn't hesitate. I mean, it, you know, against that kind of audience, I told you once, I said, it's easy to preach to you guys. But what if I was preaching to a group of college professors, <clears throat> all unbelievers, atheists, agnostics, who when I get to the part about Jesus dying and rising again and is in heaven and coming back, they're going to look at me. I mean, I'm going to feel kind of, you know, I, he's a smart guy here. <clears throat> and I'm just an old country bumpkin here. And, you know, what am I, how, what am I telling them? <laughs> And then plus, to top it all off, death on a cross was for the vilest of people. Oh, and by the way, our Savior is a criminal who was executed on the cross. You got a Savior like that? It would have been embarrassing to most people. But what does Paul say? I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let me put it into terms uh, that, that maybe we can understand. And I'm not putting any of us ask, you know, anything on anybody else. But when you look at where our churches are at, how many are found in the cities? How many are found in the, quote, upper class? How many are found most of our churches are in rural areas. Why is that? Is it because we don't, don't think that they have a chance to believe? Or is it afraid we're, they're going to condemn us in some way? Or they're going to abuse us or mock us? <clears throat> Paul himself had been rejected. He had been imprisoned. Maybe he had some intellectual shame. The fear that the gospel doesn't measure up intellectually. Now you probably had to face that. One through, you know, but we've all had to face it probably in some way, shape, or form. If you've been out any. And maybe it's social shame. Maybe they fear if they accept and proclaim the gospel, they'll be ridiculed and mocked. They'll be left without job and livelihood. They'll be passed over and cut off, rejected and ignored, left without family and friends, maybe even abused and killed. Paul, I mean, all of those things had happened to Paul. Rejected. This being scared. And I, maybe, maybe not. But I but I'm going to tell you, I believe everyone in here at some point has felt that way and refused to. Talk about God to, to proclaim the gospel because we felt that way. And we make excuses and say, well, this time's not right or whatever. But let me tell you something. The time is always right to talk about God. And there's no one who it is off limits to talk with about God. 
is the gospel of, of Christ, of God. And he was not ashamed. Sometimes as churches, we look for that narrow group of people, type of people that we think is going to hear the gospel. That won't <laughs> criticize us. That won't ridicule us. It is a shame that there's not more gospel being preached to those who are, quote, intellectuals, quote, who are smart, our class, because we fear that they will reject it. That was not the case with Paul. And we'll find that Paul, when given the finally given the opportunity to go to Rome, you know who he would want to talk to? You know who he would want to talk to? Who, who was he wanting to see? He was wanting to see Caesar. He was wanting to see the emperor. You know why he wanted to see him? Not to plead for his release, but to tell him about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Literally, the man had the power of his life in his hand, of Paul's life in his hand. He wanted to tell him about Jesus Christ. Paul was not ashamed, and neither shall we should be. We be. For it is the power, because he, he has nothing to be ashamed about, because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. He knows that the gospel, <coughs> the good news of Jesus Christ, has inherent power. We do not give the gospel power. It is the power of God. But we can hinder it. Y'all make them. That preacher, that preacher preached a powerful message. And it was just moving. I'm sorry. That was not me. That was the gospel of God. There are times... When I hinder the gospel, I, I, I mitigate it with myself. But when I give God, and when I let go of the gospel, I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> because it reaches the years that it's intended to reach. It changes the people that it intends to change. And the people who hear it have a decision to make whether to follow or not. And they will feel that power deep in their heart when they're being convicted by the Spirit of God. It has nothing to do with how well I put together a sermon. And it has, in that case, it has nothing to do with how well you present the plan of salvation to somebody. It's just the fact that you do it. <coughs> the gospel is certainly news. It is news. The good news. But it's more than information. It has an inherent power. The gospel is not advice to people. The gospel is not a kuna matata. <laughs> hey, sarah, sarah, whatever it will be. It's not, you can do it. It's not any of these slogans. The gospel is power. It is the gospel that lifts them up, not yourselves. Paul doesn't say that the gospel brings power, but that the gospel is power. And God's power at that. God has chosen to use His power in a loving way by sending men the good news, the gospel. The gospel of salvation. Being all powerful, God can wipe men off the face of the earth. And one word, we would all be gone when He got mad enough. But instead, it's chosen to give men the good news of salvation. And so this tells us a critical truth. God's nature is love. He's full of compassion and grace. He's the God of salvation, therefore He sent the gospel of Christ to the world that men may be saved. Now the Greeks knew about philosophy at his time. They knew that the intellectual thinking, that was their thing. The Romans, though, it was about power. They knew power. That's how they conquered in power. 
Power is the one thing that Rome boasted of most of all. Greece might have its philosophy, but Rome had its power. And despite all their power, like all men, the Romans were powerless to make themselves righteous with God before God. With their power, they built so many marvelous and magnificent things. Matter of fact, you can go to Rome today. And as you're going through, you can see the result of all the things that they built. I think they call them, what do they call them? The ruins. Think about it. The ruins. Their power got them what? Really nothing. power for salvation. In the Roman world, Paul's day men looked for salvation. They did. Philosophers knew that man was sick and knew man needed help. Epictetus called his lecture room the hospital for the sick soul. Epicurus called his teaching the medicine of salvation. Seneca said the, that men were so conscious of their weakness and their inefficiency and the necessary things that all men were looking toward salvation. That men were looking for a peace. Not of Caesar's proclamation, but of God's. So everyone is looking for some sort of salvation in life. The word salvation must be understood and grasped by every person upon the earth. The hope of the world is God's salvation. I can't save you. You can't save me. No philosophy. No program. Nothing in this world can actually save me from the <laughs> destiny that I, that I have because of my sin. No one can save me. <laughs> except the gospel of God. The gospel's power of salvation comes to everyone who is believing. <coughs> We're going to talk a lot about belief. In the book of Romans, it's all about believing. And it's not saying, well, I believe there's a God. Well, I believe Jesus Christ is. I and mean, you know what? I believe that he went to a cross and died. You know what? I kind of believe that he rose from the dead. It's not that kind of believing. The kind of believing that we're talking about is a trust, a, a faith when you give yourself to that person and you put your faith and you believe in him. I believe that Hitler exists, but I don't believe in Hitler. Okay? You get me? I want to have nothing to do with him. But I believe and for those who believe in Jesus Christ, those are the ones that are going to experience the power of the salvation of God. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek. And this is the pattern of the spread of the gospel. And the initial uh, ministry of the, the disciples. The gospel is God's power. And it can reach any nationality. It can reach any person, no matter who they are. No matter if they're rich or poor. No matter if they're evil or <laughs> perfect. It doesn't matter. You see, the gospel is for everyone. And we're never to be ashamed of it. And never be ashamed of speaking it to anyone. The gospel is for everyone, no matter what his race, his color, condition, circumstance, or his depravity. In the next verse. We see it reveals God's righteousness. For the righteousness of God, in it, it is being revealed from faith to faith. Man has a serious problem here. And it's one of the problems that we face as we proclaim the gospel to other people. The men think that they're righteous. That they don't need salvation. The problem is easily seen by following the, the, the pic, picturing the following. 
man thinks that he's too good, that he's good enough, and that he doesn't need to be good to accept to be acceptable to God. Man thinks that he's righteous, and that he walks righteously enough to be acceptable to God. However, there's one problem with this kind of thinking. Man is not perfect. Period. We're not. But God is perfect. And He is perfectly righteous. <clears throat> For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. I want you to understand something. <clears throat> the righteousness of God being revealed. There are two ways of looking at this. First, in the, go in the gospel, it, is, it reveals the righteousness of God. Alright? You look at it and you say, ah, there's no way that I can that I can do that. And that's good. You shouldn't. But that's not what the gospel actually does. The law does that for you. What he's talking about here, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. It is essential to understand exactly what the righteousness of God revealed by the gospel is. It does not speak that the Holy Spirit of God condemns the guilty sinner. Salvation does not condemn the guilty sinner. <coughs> but of the God, but it, what it does is the God, but of the kind of God kind of righteousness that is given to the sinner who puts their trust in Jesus Christ. This is important. When you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, He doesn't just say, here's my righteousness, live up to it. He gives you His righteousness to put in yourself. It is His righteousness. Imagine. Alright, I want you to imagine this. God comes to you and says, I'm going to put Billy Graham's righteousness in you. And I'm going to put Sister... Uh, Tree, uh, St. Teresa's righteousness. Oh, well, yeah, it's going to be an upgrade from where I'm at. But what if, and then, and then he goes, but what if he said, I'm, I'm going to put Sister Mary's righteousness in you? Okay? He doesn't do that, though. Because Billy Graham was a broad human being and did not, on his own, measure up to God's standard. St. Teresa did not, Sister Teresa, did not live up to that standard. And, well. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I don't want their righteousness. God inputs His holy righteousness within each of us that believes. <clears throat> it is, it's given to the sinner to those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. If God justifies a sinner, it does not mean that he finds reasons to prove he was right. Far from it. It doesn't even mean at this point that he makes the sinner a good man. It just means that God treats the sinner as if he had never been a sinner at all. That's true forgiveness, isn't it? We reread that. God treats the sinner as if he had not been a sinner at all. And this declaration is even greater when we understand that this is the righteousness of God given to the believer. I want you to think about something else. Adam and Eve, in their sinless condition, did not have the righteousness of God. They had their own righteousness, which was good. We have our own, we have to ourselves the righteousness of God inputted into our hearts and our lives. It's God's righteousness. Not mine, not yours, not Adam's, not Eve's, not anyone else's, but God's. And for that, well, that's a game changer, by the way. I can stop worrying about my righteousness because. He's just, he's just uh, treats me as if I've never been a sinner. He 
even when I continue to sin. The last verse this morning requires prayer. It is being revealed from faith to faith, just as it has been written and continues to be written. And the righteous, he will live out of faith. I know that changes a little bit in your Bibles. This is a more literal interpretation of it. And in some ways, I think it's easier to understand. The righteous. If you're been imputed with his righteousness, he will live out of faith. The only way man can live with God is to be made righteous, <coughs> perfectly righteous in his righteousness. How can man may be perfectly righteous? The gospel gives the answer. For by faith are you saved. It's faith. The answer to man's problem is faith. When a person believes the gospel, and I'm talking about really believes, really turns his heart and his life over, and God has made a change of him on the inside, God takes that person's faith and he counts it as righteousness. The person is not righteous. He's still imperfect. I'm still incorruptible. <laughs> and I still fall short of God's glory as a sinful human being. But God takes my faith because I believe that Jesus Christ saves me as Savior. He takes my faith and He imputes it and turns it into righteousness. Such belief honors God's Son because of that, God accepts and counts that person's faith as righteousness. Therefore, he becomes acceptable to God. He becomes acceptable to God. A little phrase there, faith to faith. I have a little different interpretation of that. It's subject to change. It, well, I suppose this beginning the, from the first from the first year faith to the end of faith, it's just it's all right. Just from revealed from faith to faith. What is revealed? The justification. I'm thinking, the way I'm thinking is your faith is revealed, your faith is in your faith. We're revealing from faith to faith is righteousness. I just want you to understand something. He said not, he didn't say this. He didn't say from faith to works. Or from works to faith. <coughs> only by faith. This faith or trust in Jesus Christ becomes the basis of life for those who are justified. Those who are declared righteous. Truly, the just shall live by faith. They're not only saved by faith, but they live out of faith. How do you understand now it's not about what we do is not about pleasing God? It's about showing what God has done for us. If He has truly justified us, imputed us with His righteousness, should we not, and we did that by faith, should we not live by faith? Too many of us, myself included, worry way too much about the things of this life. Now we should be concerned about a lot of them, but when we give to God, we're, we should be living our life by faith. We do not show God in our lives when we don't live by faith. Next week what we're going to see in, pre, in the next few sermons, we're going to see the result of not living by faith. Lots well, because they're not being justified. And then we're going to see those who believe that they're good people, but they 
really don't know Christ. And then, and then we're going to see those religion, religionists, those people who go to church and, and they go and, and but their life never manifests faith. And we're going to see how God's going to judge them. Let that not be us. Let's live by faith. Let's live this life by faith. Live out what God has changed in us. I will tell you this, maybe you're here today and you've never had that life-changing faith. Maybe you've not understood the power of the gospel before, but now you've become to realize that it's not about just sitting here listening to a sermon, it's not about singing some songs. It's about a real, real invitation to trust and believe in a God that will take your faith by your belief He'll turn it into His righteousness. And when that day comes, when you pass from this life and you and, and all the list of the deeds that you've done that were evil and, 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 and you're thinking, there's no way that I can get to heaven, God's going to look upon your heart and He's not going to see your righteousness or what you think is righteousness. What's He going to see? He'll see God's righteousness. So if you're here today and you've never accepted God's righteousness into your heart, you've never accepted His, His everlasting salvation, I believe right now that you are feeling the power of the gospel within you that's drawing you and saying, come and believe and trust. I believe this. That you understand the power of the gospel. Would you submit to it this morning? Saved children of God, who with us will we will, will we stop worrying in this life and just live our life by faith, the same kind of faith that God transformed into righteousness and gave to us, step by step, day by day, and live by faith. So as we stand and we prepare for the invitation, I don't know your heart, but let's give it to Him this morning. Let's ask Him to our heart and our life. Let's, let's follow what God wants for us in our, in our lives. Whatever is the power of the gospel dealing with you this morning, would you let Him have it? Let's bow our heads. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we ask your blessing upon these words this morning coming from your, from your holy book. We ask that we understand the power of the gospel. We, under, we ask that you understand the, the tremendous need for us to preach the gospel. We pray that we'll never be ashamed of it, that we'll always speak out and tell all of those, anyone and everyone, the, about what you've done for us. Lord, we ask that, you'll, that we'll recognize the, that this faith that transforms our, that you transform into righteousness, that we can't do this on our own, but it's because of you. And Lord, we ask today that if there's one here that has not had a saving, not had a saving faith in you, that they'll hear the gospel today and they'll feel the power of it and they'll come to know you as their personal Savior. So Lord, just be with us today. Open our hearts to this invitation which you invite them to come. In your name we pray. As we sing this morning. Number 531. <clears throat> 531.